Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God for giving us this opportunity to share the word of God. It is really great. When you think about it, that um, we are not confined to the walls of our church buildings. Uh, we echo the same words which John Wesley once said, the world is my parish. And I think wherever you are, you are now able to access the word of God. May God bless you as you listen to his word. Creator God, we believe that you formed us all in your image and likeness. A people united in our fellowship with you. We believe that your son Jesus came among us preaching repentance and forgiveness and bringing the light of the good news into a world of darkness and gloom. We believe that your spirit flows across the earth and steers us into action, telling us what to do and not what to do, inspiring us to be the disciples to keep the gospel alive and relevant. We believe in you, God, and we commit ourselves to you in faith and in trust. Amen. We want to thank God again this morning as we are going to hear the word of God coming from the book of John chapter 14, uh, verses 23 to 29, and then the book of Acts chapter 16 from verse 6 up to 40. So, we are going to hear the word being read by Brother Ben. I would ask you to listen to the word of God because it is very important for you to hear it. God bless you. Praise God and I hope you're all well this week. Uh, keep focusing on the Lord and reading his word and uh, watching some of Johnson's older messages. Uh, on YouTube, there's a, a great library there now to <coughs> look back and get inspiration from the Lord through his messages. As Johnson mentioned, we'll be reading John 14. Uh, 14 to the end. Uh, you may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If, if you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The, word can, uh, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before come to you. Before long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. On that day you will re uh, realise that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has uh, my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. And Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, when the Father will send, in, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you the world, world uh, give to you as the world gives. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. A bit more than what was required. Uh, we'll now read Acts 16, 6 to the end. Paul and his companions travelled through the region of Phygria and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put, our sail out, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samarath. And the next day, we went to Neapolis. From there, we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the, leading, uh, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expect to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to a woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Th Thyatria named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened his heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptised, she invited us to come to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally Paul came, became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ I command you to come out of her. At that moment the Spirit left her. When her owners realised that her hopes of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrate and said, These men are Jews and they are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practise. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains come loose. The jail, jailer woke up and when he saw the prison door open he drew his sword and, was, sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Do not harm yourselves, we are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. 
Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, and immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial. Even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison and now they want to get rid of us quietly. No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates and when they heard Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting that they leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with brethren, brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. This is the word of the Lord this week. Praise God. She's a beauty. Um, I encourage you to read through it again and see what more the lead, Lord leads you to. But we'll get <coughs> Johnson back to share with us what God's put on his heart this week. So it's going to be great. Praise God. I'm going to share with you on the theme, come to the mission field. Come to the mission field. Our text for this uh, morning sets down in this middle of what men may have called Paul's second missionary journey. And Luke schematizes Paul's travels and arranges them so that Paul goes on three journeys, returning twice to the headquarters of the church in Jerusalem. Paul's letters, on the other hand, gives a somewhat different account. But it is certain that Paul traveled thousands of miles for Christ in his mission to the Gentiles. As we pick up our story, Paul, accompanied by Silas, journeys through Syria, Sicilia, visiting various local congregations and strengthening them in the faith. At Lystra in Asia Minor, Timoth joins them in their travels in Acts chapter 16, verse 1 to 3. He is an appropriate Christian companion because his mother is Jewish and his father is Greek, an odd symbol of the gospel intended to both the Jews and the Greeks. That which is emphasized in our text, however, is the fact that Paul's journey are entirely guided by the Holy Spirit. The little group of travelers want to go to Asia Mine, Fiji and Galatia in uh, Exodus 16, verse 6. But the Holy Spirit forbids them from diverting there to preach. Similarly, they try to go to Bithynia, also in Asia Minor, and once again the Spirit of Jesus does not allow them to do so in Exodus 16, verse 7. Finally, while they are at Rose, on the northeast corner of Asia Minor, Paul is given a vision of a man standing and beseeching him, come over to Macedonia, in Acts chapter 16, verse 8, verse 9. Then, so in obedience to the vision, Paul and his companions set sail from Taurus, land briefly at some summer frost, on to Neapolis, and finally arrived at Philippi. An important Roman colony on the eastern border of Macedonia. They have traveled over 2,000 miles, and along the way, the Holy Spirit has shown them where to go, listening to what the Holy Spirit is. So, in the gospel lesson for the day from John 14 23 to 29, and indeed throughout chapters 14 and 16 in the fourth gospel, which tell of the Last Supper, Jesus promises his disciples that you will never leave them alone. You will never leave them desolate. That you will come to them in the spirit and teach them and defend them. In fact, it is through the work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus will continue his work on earth in chapter 16 uh, of John chapter 16 verse 11 
to verse 8 to 11. So you can see that the Holy Spirit is now the guiding compass for the disciples. It's telling them what to do and not what to do. And if they are listening to the Holy Spirit. In the writing, Acts, Luke is very conscious of that gift. It is the Holy Spirit that guides Paul on his journeys, that brings conversions, and that opens the heart of Lydia to receive Paul's words and to be baptized in Philippi. In our uh, extract, as in verse 14. So, Christian disciples and missionaries never go to it alone. We are guided by the Holy Spirit. We are moved by the Holy Spirit. They are accompanied and led and strengthened by Christ's continuing work through the, His Holy Spirit. And you and I can be sure that Christ is with us in the Spirit if we are faithful. We live by the Holy Spirit. We are guided by the Holy Spirit. Some persons have claimed in our time that they have received new revelations from Spirit. But always we must remember that the Spirit never speaks contrary to Christ. Thus, if a revelation is given, we must always ask, does it accord with Christ? Is it according to the Word of God? Is it His Spirit that has spoken or been revealed or it is an alien spirit? Paul and his companions are led by Christ to at work as they journey through the Mediterranean world. Sometimes you wonder why God chose Paul's period in history to convert the Mediterranean world. But it has often been remarked that Paul's journey were made considerable easier by the magnificent system of the Roman roads throughout that empire. God takes advantage of all sorts of human construction to advance his kingdom. Even today we are using social media to advance the kingdom of God. So we are taking advantage of all those things that men have created to spread the word of God. We are using social media that people who are far, far away from us become our friends. We are able now to talk as if they are around with us. We are able now to witness to people everywhere because of social media. So Paul used the Roman rose to spread the word of God. Paul's vision at Trials in verses 8 to 10, he had the Macedonian call, come over to Macedonia and help us. Lost souls come to the mission field. In verse 9, the people are lost in sin and without hope. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2 verse 12. Which means even me, I had without hope at some point in my life. I was lost but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I am here today because God has called me. These people have never heard the gospel. They do not know that God loves them. They do not know that Christ died to save them. They do not know that he arose and offers them eternal life. All these people. So, what does it mean? Romans 10, 14 how can they believe when they have not heard anyone? How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Which means if we intend to people to hear the word of God, if we intend people to come to Christ, we need to go with the word of God. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can they believe without someone sharing the word of God? This is what we are hearing in Romans uh, chapter 10 verse 14. So how can they hear without a preacher? That's the question. Yes, we have been called. Maybe it's because we are not going out. And that's why I said we are now even using social media platforms to reach out to people who are able to listen to what God is saying. Do you hear the calls of the lost? Are you willing to tell them of Christ and his love? Love for souls should cause us to heed the calls. Paul had a deep love for souls. Consider his love for the lost Gentiles and his missionary journeys. 
See how quickly Paul and Silas responded to the call. It says immediately. They left immediately. Which means they responded to the call of the Holy Spirit immediately. They went to Philip, the chief city of Macedonia. Paul preached a prayer meeting by the river and Lydia was converted. Look here. Lydia, a rather wealthy woman, who is a seller of valuable purple goods made from the extraction of sea cell. She is a worshipper of God, our passenger tells us, and she has gathered with a number of other pious women at a place beside the river where the women meet for prayer. The text does not say to what God the women were praying. It just says they were praying. The Roman had lots of God and the devotion of the women might have been to any of one of the those pagan gods, deities. On the other hand, perhaps Lydia had already heard of Christ and was praying to the Father. She had not yet, however, become a member of the church. But God opened Lydia's heart to give heed to what Paul was saying in verse 14. And he and her household joined the Christian community by being baptized by Paul. So the Christian faith is a communal affair. It involves incorporation into the body of believers. You need to be part of the body of believers. And Lydia joins that body when she is baptized, just as we join it at our baptisms. You cannot be a Christian by yourself. You need others. I always compare Christians to fire. When you are cooking someone, you, something, you put firewood together. Sometimes if you are making a roast outside, you put firewood together. One fire cannot complete the task. But the fire being put together does a great job. So you need to be a Christian with other Christians. You will do a great job. So this brief story of Lydia is remarkable for two things, however. First, it involves the baptism of a wealth woman. The gospel is not meant just for the poor. God's preference for the poor has been overemphasized in our time. But just as the gospel is meant for both Jew and Gentile, so it's meant for both poor and rich. In the Old Testament, Amos was a wealthy landowner. Isaiah was welcomed in the court of kings. In the New Testament, the rich tax collector Zacchaeus becomes the object of Christ's salvation in Luke 19, verse 1 to 10. And Luke tells us that wealth women supported the mission of Jesus in his disciples out of their own pockets. So the mission of God has been supported by people always. And I've seen it right now that even people who might not be in these walls are supporting the work of God because they are challenged and know that it is up to this that I should support. To be sure, wealth is given to be used wisely in the service of others. Everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required in Luke 12, verse 48. But the good news of Jesus Christ is given to rich and poor alike. We have only to receive it. Lydia was not saved by good works, but she was saved in order to do good works. She proved the reality of her faith by opening her home to Paul, Silas, and Timon. We hear when they moved out of prison, it is to Lydia's home that they were hospitalized. So you can see something here. Another day, when Paul and his companions were going to the place of prayer, they met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, possessed by a demon. She was able to foretell the future and to make others outstanding revelation. In this way, she brought considerable income to her masters. When she met the Christian missionaries, and for many days thereafter, she followed them, crying out, These are the servants of the Most High who proclaim to us the way of salvation. What she said was true. But Paul knew better to accept testimony from demons. He knew that the testimony, yes, was true. But it was coming from a demon. And also he was grieved because of the wretched condition of the enslaved girl. So in the all-powerful name of Jesus, he commanded the demon to come out of here. Immediately she was freed from this dreadful bondage. 
and became sane and rational person, demonism is reality. It is reality. And I've seen so many people who are possessed by demons. In my ministry, I've watched a lot of people. I've even able also to deliver people from demon possessed, to cast out the demons in the name of Jesus. So this girl in Paul's day was demon possessed. She was a slave girl and the masters were using her to make a profit through her. In prison, Paul and Silas reached the jail for Christ. There is the jailer for Christ in uh, verses 23 and 34 of Acts chapter 16. So the midnight hour found Paul and Silas praying and singing. Their joy was completely independent of every circumstance. Think about it. We only think of people singing when they are thought to be free. Not to be singing while they are in prison. Th think about it. They were singing joyful songs while they were in prison. And everyone was listening to them. And they were looking at these guys to say, what type of people are these? How can they sing when they are in prison? What it means, they were completely independent of ethnic circumstances. As the other prisoners were listening to their prayers and hymns of praise God, the prison was robbed by an unusual earthquake. Something happened which has never happened and it opened all the doors. And lose the stocks and chains, but did not demolish the building. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison wide open, he assumed that the prisoners had made their escape. Aware that his own life would be forfeited, he drew his sword to commit suicide. But Paul assured him there was no need for him to stop because all the prisoners were still present. And accounted for. Stop. Don't kill yourself. We are all here. We have not escaped. It's only that the doors are open. And we are no longer chained. We have been unchained. And this causes the jailer to say these words. He cried. Say, what must I do to be saved? That's a great question. What must I do to be saved? This question must precede every genuine case of conversion. A man must know he's lost before he can be saved. You cannot be saved until you know that you are lost. And sometimes you don't know that you are lost until someone comes and tells you that you are lost. Because you are thinking that you are okay. It is a premature to tell a man how to be saved until first he can say from his heart, I truly deserve to go to hell. The suicide of jail became a believer. The one who was about to commit suicide became a believer. What a difference. He had put the stripes on this man. He was also part of the beating of Paul and Silas. But now we are here, we, we are hearing something. Now he washes their feet. He washes their stripes. From someone beating to someone washing. What a great change. Great victories await us when we hit the call to reach out the lost. Look around. The mission field surrounds us. The field is the world in Matthew 13 verse 38. Your Macedonian begins at your door. We all meet lost people everywhere we go. Have you ever noticed that they are there? They are lost people who need the direction we need to be called into the house of God. See, Paul and Silas seized the opportunity in Macedonia. How many opportunities have you seized today? How many people have you told of Jesus in this love? Think about it. Wherever you are, they met Lydia, and Lydia was converted in other women. Not only Lydia. A demon-possessed girl, they met her, and she was turned to Christ. A jailer was also converted. So even not him and even his household was also converted. So, in conclusion, do you hear the cries of the lost ones around you? They are crying out for your message every day. What about your neighbor? To your right. 
What about your neighbor to your left? What about your neighbor behind you? What about your neighbor in front of you? What about the people you sit closer to when you are having your coffee? Outside there. If you ever thought of them and talk about Jesus Christ, come over to Macedonia. Come over and help. I'm calling everyone who is regarding himself as a Christian to come out and share the word of God. It is your duty. It is my duty. So we are being called to win souls for Christ, not for our own benefit. May the good Lord help us, brothers and sisters, as we continue to minister to those lost souls. In Jesus' name, amen. You are not going on your own. The Holy Spirit always accompanies you. God bless you. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We even confess, God of openness and love, there have been times when we have wanted to be only with our own sake of friends and have not been willing to look beyond ourselves to welcome others whom you love. Forgive us and lock our hearts and minds that we may be inclusive and daring and willing to go where you would lead us. Meet with those who have called us for the sake of your kingdom. God of faith and adventure, for the book of Acts we praise you. For the witness and courage of Paul we praise you. For the faithfulness and generosity of Lydia we praise you. For the challenge of your story we praise you. For the legacy of your people we praise you. For those who inspire us today we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us uh, take our offering as we thank God for what God has done in our lives and is still doing. And remember, it's always a thanksgiving offering. Why do you need to do it? Because you just want to say, this life that I have, Seeing each day, being alive at a day like this, is by the grace of God. So just say, thank you, Lord. So as you take your offering, you are thanking God for what God has done. Let us thank God. Father, we thank you for all the things that you have given us, for all the gifts you have given us. We thank you for the special gift of life. We are here alive because we now, we are being reminded that it is only through you that you take care of us. Father, the win of souls, the love of souls, we bring our offerings to you. May you bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, glorious God, you shine your light in the dark places of our lives and of our world. Gentle God, you touch us with your healing love and make us whole. Mm -hmm. We ask you to be with us and shine through us this week and use us to bring hope and healing to others. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all from now and evermore, brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name. Amen.